Howdy everybody! Someone in the comments of the last video asked me to do that as a inside joke to their girlfriend and I thought that was adorable so <laughs> shout out to Cinnamon Batface's girlfriend. I hope you're both having a wonderful day. Anyway, hi my name is Rebecca and welcome to this bonus episode of TJLC Explained. Bonus because it's probably gonna be really really short. Today I'm going to explain the meaning of three numbers used on the show. Like I said this is gonna be pretty short but this is something I wanted to talk about and I figured I should just give it its own video. So do you remember a while back when I said that there was a decoder ring for most of the symbolism on the show. Yeah, as I'm doing these, it's becoming increasingly obvious that the decoder ring usually has something to do with Irene. Like food is sex? Yeah. Mirroring? Yes. The deer stalker? Oh yeah. Phone is heart metaphor? Look, it wouldn't even be a thing without her. Say what you want about her as a character, but she's basically the key to John Locke's symbolism all by herself. Like, I'm impressed. And all three numbers I'm going to talk about show up in A Scandal in Belgravia, which I finally learned to say correctly after three years. Sorry to everyone, I've been driving crazy with that. Sorry. I'll start with the super quick one, 221. As you probably already know, Sherlock and John's address is 221B Baker Street. It's not particularly complicated. Although Sherlock's first guess at Irene's password after he knows she's alive and thinks this whole thing is a romantic game is to associate those romantic advances with the home he shares with John. You think she's my girlfriend because I'm x-raying her possessions? Well, we all do silly things. Yes. They do, don't they? Very silly. She sent this to my address. She loves to play games. She does? And the screen displays the truth about Sherlock's heart. He's 221B locked. The next number I'm gonna cover is 57. You may recognize this as the number of times John heard Irene message Sherlock. 57? Sorry, what? 57 of those texts, the ones I've heard. Thrilling that you've been counting. Just a random throwaway number, right? How funny that John is counting all of the texts Irene sends to Sherlock. Ha <laughs> ha, hashtag bromance. Yeah, except that isn't the story they're telling and every detail matters. They could have picked any random number and walked out of here with all the subtlety they're working for, but they just couldn't resist it, could they? So if you dig a little deeper, you'll come across Shakespeare's Sonnet 57, which you'll notice is remarkably appropriate. Being your slave, what should I do but tend upon the hours and times of your desire? I have no precious time at all to spend, nor services to do, till you acquire. Nor dare I chide the world without end hour, whilst I, my sovereign, watch the clock for you. Nor think the bitterness of your absence sour, when you have bid your servant once adieu. Nor dare I question with my jealous thought, where you may be, or your affairs suppose. But, like a sad slave, stay and think of naught, save where you are, how happy you make those. So true a fool's love, that in your will, though you do anything, he thinks no ill. Well, that was painful. And remember that 57 is associated with phones. With hearts. If this just happened to work out this way with no planning on their part, I'd be much more surprised. And finally, we get to the other number that Sherlock guesses when he's trying to break into Irene's phone. 1895. The count on your blog is still stuck at 1895. Uh, yes, yeah, faulty. Can't seem to fix it. Faulty. Or you've been hacked and it's a message. Hmm? This is my favorite of the bunch. I guess I could start with an explanation of why this year is important to the Holmes canon specifically. Many people consider 1895 to be Holmes' greatest year. Vincent starred among them, who dedicated a poem to Sherlock and John called 221B, which begins and ends by stating, Here dwell together still two men of note, who never lived and so shall never die. Here, though the world explode, these two survive, and it is always 1895. That's why John's blog counter is stuck at that number. For them, it is always 1895. Or it was. The blog counter has since been removed. Because there's another very important event which took place in 1895, one that is perhaps even more relevant than the Vincent Starrett poem. Oscar Wilde was tried for homosexual behavior in 1895, and it was a very dangerous time to be gay in London. Within the Holmes canon, the adventure of the three students draws attention to this event. It was in the year 1895 that a combination of events, into which I need not enter, caused Mr. Sherlock Holmes and myself to spend some weeks in one of our great university towns. 
How convenient. 1895 is the epitome of the homophobic culture which has been haunting Holmes and Watson since they were first created. It's something that the stories haven't quite been able to escape. And what else took place in 1895? The Abominable Bride. This detail is so important to them that they mentioned multiple times in interviews that the episode was set in 1895. The series is set in 1895, not 1885. When asked whether the 1895 setting will make a difference, he teased, it does. Wait and see. All the difference. And yet, Nothing specifically related to the Holmes canon in 1895 happened in the episode. So why was it so important that we knew the episode took place in 1895? They wanted to draw attention to Oscar Wilde's trial, to a time when it was dangerous for Sherlock and John to be in love. Repressed as he is, Sherlock's mind instantly gravitates to that year when he's reconstructing the case. He's doomed to be stuck in 1895 forever and suffer the same fate as the original Holmes. Except he isn't they change the story. John saves Sherlock on the Reichenbach Falls. And back in their home, Sherlock imagines a world where they're safe to be together. Our world. In any case, I know I would be very much at home in such a world. Oh, I don't think I would be. I beg to differ. But then I've always known I was a man out of his time. Like I said, the blog counter isn't stuck at 1895 anymore. Seriously, you can check the website yourself, it's not there. The writers love and care about the original stories, and they want to use that knowledge to finally bring the truth to light. They hinted as much in the background of his last vow. Information is the power to change 1895. And change it they will. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this bonus episode. Thank you as always to Stacy for editing this script for me. I reference posts by Painlock and Vauxhall and I, sorry for getting that wrong in the last video, as well as The Adventure of the Three Students by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 221B by Vincent Starr, and Shakespeare's Sonnet 57, as well as an article on the original Holmes timeline. You can find all of these resources linked in the description below. If you've been sad about these shorter episodes, don't worry, I'm pretty sure the episode on a skin and Belgravia is going to be the longest one yet. I have a lot of heteronormativity to cut through, so I hope you're looking forward to that, and until then, get ready to believe. Also, get ready for the live stream. Be there. It's gonna be fun. We're gonna hang out. It's gonna be cool. Be a bomb. The Abominable Bride. Blah, blah. The Abominable Bride. I can't say it. The Abominable Bride. The Abominable Bride. The Abominable <laughs> The Abominable The Abominable The Abominable Bride. Why is that word so hard to say? Bye!